You can turn with me in your Bibles today to the book of Psalm chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. We've been looking at the characteristics of our God. It's important for us as believers in Christ to, to know our God, to know who he is. And really there's no excuse for us to not know God because we do have the scriptures for us to read and study. And there are so many resources available to us today uh, that give us that opportunity to learn about God. Um, one of those resources is, is the gift that our church has for people is the Right Now Media. Uh, it's a subscription service that you can watch. There's over 20,000 videos of preaching and teaching and just fun stuff as well. I've shared that with many people. I actually shared it with a couple of people just this week and one of them signed up. And so it's a tool. It's an opportunity for us to learn and know more about God. So it's important for us. And so over the next several weeks, we're taking a look at who our God is. And I'm using the word Thanksgiving as an acrostic. And so we've been looking at the characteristics of God. And each week it starts with one of the letters from Thanksgiving. The first First week was truth. We looked at our God is truth. And it's important to know that God is not just truth, but he's absolute truth. You know, and that's been since the beginning of time, people have doubted what real truth is. Uh, we use the scripture where Pontius Pilate actually asked Jesus the question, what is truth? And Jesus is like, well, you're looking at it. He didn't say that, but that's what it was, is Jesus is truth. And then the next week was God is holy. God says, I am holy, therefore be ye holy. And these are hard. I'm not going to lie, you know, to, to, to succumb and surrender to the fact that God is absolute truth, that God is absolutely holy, and he asks us to be holy as well. And then last week we used the letter A, and it was a little bit nicer, but our God is available. And so even though our God is absolute truth and that he is holiness and, and you know, and pictured for you and I, he is completely 100% available to you and I today. We can go directly to God in prayer to talk to him, to commune with him. He hears us. He answers our prayers. He's there to help us, to guide us, to direct us in our life. And what a blessing it is to know that God is available. Now, the next letter is the letter N. And the next thing I want us to look at today about our God is the fact that God is never ending. You might say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, think about that for a second. Okay. To mean that God is never ending means that he has no beginning and he has no ending. And we'd be lying to ourselves if we said we understand that. Because you and I, we have a beginning. Okay, uh, Mine is October 12th, just in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> just saying. But anyway, we have a beginning and we will have an ending as well. I personally think my ending is going to be when I hear the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel calling us to meet the Lord in the clouds. That's what I think, you know, but I think God wants us to believe that way, to be ready for the Lord's return at any moment. Actually, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the message. But my friends today, it's hard for us to understand somebody who is never ending, but he truly is. You know, our, that's who our God is. He, he, there's no beginning to him. There is no ending to him. He always has been. He always will be. And I don't know about you, but that brings a peace and a comfort to my heart to know that. There's only one deity, only one God, that actually claims to have created this world that we live in. I don't know if you ever thought about that before. But all other gods, all other deities, all other beings that are what out there just kind of were here. But God is the only one who said, let there be light. He is the one that formed this earth that we live in today. The only deity that does that. That's our God. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's that creator God, that God, Jehovah. And so that's who we're talking about. He is never ending. And again, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that, but it's the truth of who he is. And what a powerful, powerful story this is to know that, that, that our God has always been and always will be. My premise for the message today is this, because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, and it says, if in this life only we have in Christ, we are of all men, what? Most miserable. My friends, if you only have hope in, in your being, your deity, your God, or whatever in this life, what hope is that? But our, our hope goes beyond that to the next life. I know that if I should die, but when I pass from this life to the next, I know where I'm going to be. The Bible very plainly says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'll know that I'll be ushered into God's presence in that moment. And not because I'm a good person, but because I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. 
I know that on August 18th of 1983, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I prayed and asked God to forgive me of my sins and to save my wretched soul. And I know that on that day, He did, that He saved my soul that day. And I thank God for that day. And I know that I'm part of that family. And so there are a lot of people today going through life. And they're sad, they're scared, they're worried. You know, especially when you watch the news and see everything that's going on in the world today and see all the anger and the hatreds and the violence and the fighting and everything that happens, you know, and, and I don't know about you, but this upcoming election, my main thought for this next election is, is, is like, is this serious, the best two candidates we have to vote for? <laughs> so that's my thoughts, but whatever, okay? So I don't mean to get political or anything like that, but it's just like, and so a lot of people look at these things and we worry. And I remember being a child before I got saved, worrying about things. But then that day that I met God and that day that Jesus saved my soul, it changed things. And it started to change my perception of this world because my hope is not in this world. My hope is in God who is everlasting. He is never ending. He has no beginning and no ending. That's who my God is. And that's what brings us hope in our hearts and lives today. I hope that's why we come to church is to, to worship and to fellowship with that never ending God, that everlasting God. You know, I've always thought very highly of God. Mind you, growing up as a child, I did not have a great life. I'm not complaining. I'm not whining. We all can share our stories of things that we've gone through in our life. You know, we, we all have that story. And so mine is I come from a broken home and whatever from there. You can take it from there. There's things I don't like to talk about and such. And so it's not like I had this great life growing up or anything like that. I didn't. But even as a child... I had a holy reverential fear of God. And I want to share with you a little bit of my story. What you're looking at on the wall right now is St. Gregory's Church in Northeast Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up. It's an absolutely gorgeous building, I have to tell you that. I love growing up in that church. It was beautiful. And that's where I learned my fear of God. I wasn't saved at the time. I didn't know Jesus as my Savior. But going to that church Sunday after Sunday... That's where I learned that God is a great God. In the 1980s, they used to sing, our God is an awesome God. And, and so however you want to look at it, that's who our God is. If the outside's beautiful, look, here's some pictures from the inside. All the windows have those beautiful stained glass windows with all the saints in the windows. And look at that organ. Oh my goodness, the music that came out of that organ. But that's where I learned my fear of God. And I've never lost it. In all my years of living, all my years of, of, of walking this face of this earth, I have never lost that holy reverential fear of God. We need that. That's the purpose behind this never-ending God. That's who our God is. So many times people want to minimize God and make him small. And they want to criminalize God and say, oh, he's mean and hateful. That's not who our God is. Our God is an awesome God. He is a never-ending God. The scripture says that he is from everlasting to everlasting. That's who our God is. And that, I don't know about you, but to me, that brings great peace and comfort to my heart. I'm going to hitch my wagon to that God because I know he's going to take me all the way to the very end. Amen? And so I'm very thankful for that. And so truly our God is never ending. That means that he is eternally existent. The very first verse in the Bible, the very first word spoken, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. In the very beginning, God was already there. The Bible says this world was void and without form and God spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light. And he began to form and create this world that we live in. But the fact of the matter is, is that when that beginnings for you and I started, God was already there. He is eternally existent. And again, I'd be lying to you if I said I totally understand that. I understand the premise. I understand the concept. But to truly wrap my human mind around that, to think that, that God doesn't have a beginning, that he's always been, and that he'll always be. You know, Satan's doing everything that he can to defeat the purposes of God in this world today. But ultimately, God will win. Ultimately, Satan will be bound. He will. The Bible says death and hell and the, and the beast and, and Satan himself, Beelzebub, will be bound and cast into the life, lake of fire for all eternity. You know, sadly, there are those who don't accept Jesus as Savior that will be part of that fate as well. But that's their choice, you, whether you choose Jesus or whether you choose to follow the ways of the world. But my friends, God is eternally existent. 
He has always been and always will be. And it just saying that brings a smile to my face, you know. Everybody likes to brag and say, oh, my kid's the best kid. Or my sports team is the best sports team. Or my, you know what I mean? Well, I can honestly say with all truth and honesty that my God is the best God that there is. That's who God is. He is eternally existent. And even this mighty, powerful Eternally existent God has an inexhaustible mercy for you and I today. Oh, what a comfort that is to my soul. Because I know I'm not perfect. Is there anyone here today that's perfect? Yeah. We know that we're not. Matter of fact, when we look in the mirror, most of the time we see our faults. We see the things that we've done and said that we wish we hadn't. Place, you know what I mean? Then that's what most people do. That's what we look at. But I'm so thankful for God's mercy. And God's mercy is just simply him withholding judgment that we deserve. We deserve that judgment. We have transgressed his law. We have broken the commandments that God has given to us. And we are, we are deserving of that punishment. But God looks at us. And if you're saved today, he sees the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he forgives us of our sins. I'm so very thankful for that. The Bible says in Psalm 103. I never even read our text today. <laughs> Sorry about that. But in Psalm 103, I'll get to it here in a second. But in Psalm 103, verse 17, it says, The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. And so not only is our God this mighty, awesome, powerful, awesome God who is eternally existent, but he also has inexhaustible mercy. We can never exhaust the mercy of God. You know, you ever have a child that's just exhausting? You know what I mean? <laughs> a child or grandchild as you raise them and stuff, and you're just like, Argh. and sometimes maybe some of us do the same thing to God with our actions and the things that we do, but God will never go, Argh. get this child away from me because of that inexhaustible mercy. <laughs> our text, I, I did, I skipped over that, but in Psalm 90, it says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God that's our God before there was anything God was there that's who he is and he has this mercy for me today I'm so very thankful the Bible also says that his mercies are renewed every day you know, and so even if you could exhaust the mercies of God, he renews it each and every day you think of all the billions of people in this world doing their own thing following their own truth instead of the absolute truth of God. And yet he has that inexhaustible mercy. Why? Because the sole purpose of why we're still here today still goes back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves people and he wants folks to be saved he wants people to repent and turn to him and ask for forgiveness and ask for salvation so that he could scoop you up and take you into his presence and into the family of god and so our god that's who he is he has this inexhaustible mercy and i need that i don't know about you but i know i need that in this life that i live and i'm so very thankful that's who my god is and not only does he have inexhaustible mercy but our God has unlimited power, unlimited power. You realize this world that we live in, that's one of the biggest fears of all the, the governments and the world powers that be is, is that we're going to run out of power someday. We've become power greedy. You ever think about that? I forget the number of billions of, of gallons of gasoline that the world consumes every day. And now they're trying to find all these renewable sources. You ever hear one of those electric cars go down the road? just sounds wrong <laughs> you know it's been there's there's a there's an electric mustang in town and every time i see it go by I just like no that's just wrong a mustang's supposed to go roar you know yeah. not so whatever you know but you know they're, they're always trying to find renewable sources of power and trying to find energy and such and so you know we take for granted so many times we walk into a room and flip on a light switch and 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 there's light or we open the fridge and the little light comes on and everything's cold we take those things for granted but my friends today we have a god who has unlimited power there is nothing that god cannot or will not do within the confines of his will. Isaiah put it this way. He says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is weary. My friends, that's my God. He is never ending. 
And he has unlimited power. He is always there to come alongside of me. He is always there to lift me up. He is always there to carry me through the valley of despair. That's my God. He has that power. I don't know about you, but this blesses my heart just talking about it, thinking about it. That's the God that I knew as a child growing up, even though I wasn't saved. Going to that church, I love sitting in that church and listening to that organ play. And I used to stare at those windows and just waiting for them saints to start dancing in the windows. They never did, but I kept waiting for it and such. But as a child, you know, it's just like, oh, that's God. And I'm so very thankful on the day that I met him when I actually asked Jesus to be my savior. And he saved my soul. And he has just solidified in my heart that this is what we're supposed to be doing in this life. I'm so very thankful that God has always had his hand upon my life. And if you're here today and you're saved, you know Jesus is your Savior. God's done the same thing upon you. He has had your, his hand upon you since the very beginning. He has been guiding you and directing you to the very point that you are sitting here right now. Now let's think that forward. If God has guided you through his unlimited power to this point today, why are we so fearful and worried that he's going to stop? He's not. He's going to continue to be there for us. He's going to continue to guide us. He's going to continue to lead us. Even if we are going through the valley of the shadow of death. I read a little meme last night. It says the rain, when we have an umbrella, the umbrella does not stop the rain. The umbrella allows us to walk in the rain. God does not stop the storms in our life. Faith in God allows us to walk through the storms in life. We're always going to have storms. We're always going to have things that disrupt our peace as we know it. Those things are going to happen. If you're going through a season of storm right now, then let me encourage you that God's power is unlimited. He's there for you. And as he has delivered you to this point, he'll continue to deliver you till that day that you come to meet him face to face. He's never going to stop. He's always going to be there. If you're going through a season of peace, Praise God for that, okay? Thank God for the peace that he brings in our heart and life, okay? Friends, listen to me. When I'm at a moment of peace in my life, I tend to hide. I'm like, I don't want nothing to happen, you know? No, I'm just kidding. I continue to live life, amen? And continue to share the love of God with other people that we, that we know and come in contact with as well. And so again, our premise again says that if in this life only we have hope in God Almighty, then we are of most men, of all men, most miserable. And I tell you today that my hope isn't just in this world. I know that if I should die or if the Lord should return, okay, I'm going to be with God and I look forward to that day, okay. I know that God is building me a mansion on a hilltop and I'm going to have my dwelling place with him and I'm going to be a part of the new heaven and the new earth. You know, and it's just, I've heard other preachers and such talk about how that when we get that get there that day that you know it's just like when jesus wanted to go somewhere he was just there i think we're going to be able to do that could you imagine that you know it's just like if you wanted to be like if i wanted to go see my son in biloxi i could just say i'm going down to see mark oh hi mark how you doing that would be awesome but anyway so I, we don't know exactly what it's going to be like but you know, who knows it's going to be cool so anyway that's who our god is he is never ending but he's not also never ending that's not all he's never changing Going along with this, I think these two go hand in hand. Our God is never changing. The Bible says that he, in, in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whether you say Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit, they're all the same. But that's who our God is. He is completely 100% reliable. He does not change. You have that friend that's always changing their mind. That person that you know that can't make up their mind. That person that you just cannot count on because they're always changing this, that, or the other. You know, and if you've ever raised teenagers, you know how that is. One week they like one thing, and the next week they like another thing. And they're, they're mad at you because you don't understand, okay? That's not God. When he wrote the Ten Commandments, when he gave them to Moses, that, that's been set in stone. He doesn't change. His word is forever settled in heaven. He has said he never changes. He is completely 100% reliable. Whatever God said, you can count on it. What is sin is sin. What is right is right. What God has promised is promised. His promises are reliable. The, 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 the exceeding precious promises of God that Peter talks about. That's who our God is. He does not change. He is never changing. You know, and that's a good thing. Some people might think, oh, we need to learn to change and stuff. But no, not our God. But again, remember, he is absolute truth and he is holiness. And so he doesn't need to change and he doesn't. You can count on him. I know that if I do this, this is what's going to happen, plain and simple. You know, and maybe that's comforting to me because I'm a mathematical kind of guy as opposed to music and arts and stuff like that. I don't get arts and stuff. 
I've told you before, I can't even make a stick figure look like a human being. But anyway, and so, but I like science and math, and I like the fact that two plus two equals four. That's the way my mind thinks, and that's who our God is. He is to completely and totally 100% reliable. And I'm thankful for that today. And he is also honorable because he is never changing. Malachi put it this way. He says, God, he told, God told Malachi, and Malachi told the world. He says, for I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God is a God of his word. He will do exactly what he said he is going to do. That is honor to the highest degree. You know, how many times have we promised somebody we're going to do something? Eh, we forget. We get busy. We don't do it. And things fall apart. We've all been a part of that, one side or the other. Amen? God's not like that. He is a God of his word. He's completely honorable. If God said, I'm going to do it, he's going to do it. Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen? He's returning to this earth again. He promised it. He said it's going to happen. And the Bible says, be ye also ready, for in time as you think not, the Son of Man is going to come again for you and I. And so that day is coming. We need to be sure of that, as, as, as sure as anything in our life, okay? And so our God is completely honorable, and he's completely gracious. This is the blessings of God in our life. James put it this way, every good gift and every perfect gift come from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God's blessing will always be there. He will be always gracious to you and I in our life. Think about all the blessings that God has bestowed upon you in your life. Many times we don't even see the blessings. Many times we don't even realize what God has done. Sometimes God's blessing, sometimes God's graciousness is disguised as a, a trial or a tribulation. It keeps us from someplace we're not supposed to be. It keeps us from doing something we shouldn't be doing. And so don't look at every bad thing in your life as something bad. It may be the grace of God keeping you away from something you shouldn't be a part of. Who knows? But his grace will always be there because he is a never-changing God. He will always be gracious to you and I. You know, it, it, it's, I kind of liken it to a grandparent and a grandchild. You know, there's nothing like a grandchild to turn a grandparent's heart to mush. You know, and they just, they do anything. I, I, I had good grandparents. My grandma and grandpa, they were awesome. And they spoiled me rotten. I turned out all right, amen. So, but anyway, so thankful for that. But our God truly is a gracious, a gracious God. I want you to turn with me in closing to the book of Titus. I want you to see, what should our response from this be? Knowing that God is never ending, knowing that God is never changing, that he has, that he's eternally existent. He is inexhaustible mercy. He has unlimited power. Knowing that he is reliable and honorable and gracious. Knowing all these things is great. But what should my response be? What should I do? And I think the Bible tells us here in Titus chapter 2. Down in verse 11. If you look with me there. And we'll just close with three simple thoughts from this passage of scripture. Talking about that time when Jesus Christ comes back. As I said, that day is coming, amen. I feel it's coming in my lifetime, I really do. Whether it does or not, I don't know, but I, I think God wants us to live that way, constantly looking for Jesus' return. And so knowing that God is never ending, that he is from everlasting to everlasting, that he has always been and that he always will be, and that Jesus is coming back to gather us together to be a part of that eternal kingdom. This is what Paul tells Titus here in chapter 2, verse 11. He says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Let me just say, make sure that you're saved today. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior love to share with you how you can know that you're saved today but that grace of God has brought salvation to all men teaching us and this is what we learn from this that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so knowing all that we do, three simple things. First of all, that first verse that we read there, we need to live righteously. Live according to that absolute truth that we talked about a few weeks ago. 
Live a life of holiness. We need to live righteousness. Live righteously. Let me use the right word. Live righteously. That's who we need to be today in this world. So many people today want to do what is right in their own eyes. We see it more and more. And so many people make excuses for our behavior and the things that we do that are contrary to the truth of God's word. But knowing that our God, knowing that he is always there for us, that he always been and always will be, should motivate us, encourage us to live a righteous life in this world so that others can see there should be evidence in our life that other people want to say, I want what that person has. I want what's going on in their life. I want to be a part of that. Live righteously so that others, you're just like infectious and contagious to other people. As you know, I have a job outside. I work in the public. You know, and people, they, they think nothing of coming into the store. <laughs> Sneezing, coughing all over the place. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, stuff like just uh, germs everywhere. It's probably why I'm sick right now, but anything. Well, you know, could you imagine if Christians would have that attitude? If we just spew Jesus everywhere we go, thanking God, praising him, you know, for everything that we do. You know, I, I used to watch a lot of sports. I don't so much anymore. I, I believe like my grandpa, it's all corrupt. It's all fake. But anyway, and so, but, you know, I always like it when these athletes, when they interview them and they, they give praise to God, the first thing they do is they give praise to God. And the best part about it is, is it makes everybody squirm and uncomfortable. Ooh, they're talking about God and stuff. I think it's awesome. You know, you keep praising the Lord. But could you imagine if more Christians would do that? If we would live a righteous life and just praise God in everything that we do, what a difference that would make in this world. And then in the next verse, he talks about looking for that blessed hope. Again, our hope isn't just in this life. Our hope is when Jesus Christ comes back, when we hear the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel, which says, come up hither, and we go to be in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air, and so shall ye ever be with the Lord. Oh, what a day that's going to be, brother and sister, when we're with him. We need to be looking forward to that. Really, every day that we wake up, we should be thinking, this could be the day. This could be the day that Jesus Christ comes back. Am I ready? Am I living righteously? Have I shared my faith with people? Have I tried to bring as many people along with me as I possibly can? Looking for that blessed hope. That's how God wants us to live our lives. This life that we live is just a moment. The Bible says it's just a vapor that appeareth for a while and then vanisheth away. But in eternity we'll be there forever. And the Bible says that we'll have no more sin, no more sickness, no more pain, no more, no more, oh, where'd everybody go? <laughs> no more glasses, none of it. It'll all be gone. You won't have to worry about your, your diabetes. My arthritis pain will be gone. Woo, looking forward to that day. My friend, ouch. But anyway, and so that's what that's how we're supposed to live. So live righteously, looking for that blessed hope. And then the last verse there tells us to be uh, zealous of good works. Not just doing good works, but be zealous of it. Looking for any way, any way that you could possibly help someone else. Holding a door, you know, buy someone groceries, help them out in their yard work, whatever. Looking for ways to be a blessing to other people. Could you imagine if more people would do that? If we would look beyond ourselves and our own shortcomings and our own heartaches and pains and miseries and be zealous of good works to do for others. Jesus lived his entire life serving other people, never once concerned for himself, never once concerned for his own needs. Never once worried for his own life as he went to the cross and willingly gave his life so that you and I could be saved. And so three very simple things in response to our never-ending, never-changing God. Live righteously, okay? Look for that blessed hope and be zealous of good works. It's not hard, amen? We can do that, can't we? Sure we can. And I'm counting on each and every one of us to do that, okay? And so I want you all to write a 10-page report front and back in the line. I want to know what everybody did this next week, okay? 